Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Battleground Countdown. My name is Aaron Canole, your host for this evening. I hope everybody tuned into yesterday's episode already for this return series of uploads uh, for the worst of 2023 films. Uh, I was joined by Austin Howell and Jordan Owens for that. We had a fun episode. Go check that one out. And today, on the, I believe, still Day of the Razzies and Eve of the Oscars, uh, we are going to be doing our own rewrite of the Oscars, so to speak. Uh, I'm joined, of course, by Jacob Barber and Malcolm Lay. Uh, guys, welcome. First off, how are we doing? Doing great. Awesome. I'm um, happy to have you guys here. I I'm happy to have you guys in particular because similar as to how with the last episode, I you know, reached out to those two in particular uh, because I know they see so many films that they were inevitably going to have an assorted amount of bad films. Um, and in the same way that I, I'm bringing uh, Matt and uh, Amaru on for the best list because I know that they go have gone to festivals and gone to different things throughout the year and obviously Rue's a, a reviewer as well. So they have a heightened sense of film you guys i would say fall somewhere in the middle where you both see a lot of films throughout the year i know that just from talking with you you guys see a lot of films throughout the year but i feel like you don't necessarily lean one way or the other i feel like you guys have your own and by that i should explain that better you have your own sense of taste and i like that and I think that when we're talking about the Oscars, there is such a mindset of what people think is an Oscars film that I wanted people who I felt had a unique voice in this group to be a part of the episode. That was leading to a positive thing. I realized halfway through that was starting to sound very <laughs> weird, but it was a positive the whole time, uh, of course. So I always like to start off, uh, Jacob, I'll go to you first. Uh why the Oscars? Like, why is this something that people still pay attention to? Why does it even exist still, right? Because what does it matter? True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think it, for me, it's just it's just fun fun to watch. Uh, it's it's fun to see. Like, obviously, we all have those movies that we're rooting for. Um, sometimes we have movies that we want to root for and we can't. Um, hence this episode. Um, mm. but for me, it's just. I think it's just a fun way to, you know, honor movies and celebrate cinema. Um, you know, this kind of this year end wrap up, um, even though it's, you know, a quarter of the way <laughs> through the new year. Uh, that always, that always got me. It's like three months in. We're just now talking about the, the best of last year. Um, hey, man. The I, Super I Bowl happened in February. That's true. Uh, I would get the love for the Oscars. I don't like put any stock in it. I just, I just think it's fun to see. Like, oh yeah, no, that was that was cool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad those movies are are getting recognition. Yeah, yeah. And then Malcolm, I'll go down to you. Obviously, in addition to the previous reason I stated, part of the reason I reached out to you is because over on Take Three, you've actually, I believe, for a couple of years now, correct, been a host yeah. of an Oscar show, Gone with the Wind. Uh, you're joined by, of course, Dan Allen. And this year, I know you were joined by another host. I apologize. I do not know his name offhand if you want to throw it out there. It's um, Louis Mendes. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, it, Sorry, Louis. Well, it, <laughs> um, I mean, he probably doesn't know who you are either. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair and true. So, <laughs> um, But, I mean, um, it, it's one of those ones like I was um, – find it interesting just to sort of see where the trend like um there's trends in that are going like it's one of those ones especially this year's like um you know that nolan probably got, got a good shot of winning directly because he's been getting all the awards all through there like but i i always just find it interesting um it's also one of those ones that sometimes get gets a bit tedious as well some as well just just try to keep track of all the different guilds and um, things and sometimes people just like to talk and that makes the show go long sometimes but yeah yeah of course so yeah so the way that it's going to work uh is we have picked out nor in keeping with the theme since it's not a traditional countdown episode we've picked out 11 categories 
uh, the uh, big eight, you should say, the ones that people probably put the most stock in, best picture, best director, the four acting categories, and the two screenplay categories. And then between themselves, Jacob and Malcolm decided we would be also doing best original score, best original song, and best animated film. So those are the ones we're going to be discussing here tonight. Um, and so what we've done is these guys have put together their own unique lists uh the five the five that they would nominate for each award um i've gone through and counted up the stats and any film that immediately crosses over onto at least two of our lists is going to make the shows list in general uh but aside from that we also are going to then uh, kind of work together to decide what should go on the list. And when I say work together, I mean the exact opposite of that. Uh, so we, I counted up before the show started, we have 15 open slots. So of all the categories, there are 15 slots left for us to put in nominations. So we each get five. Essentially, we can call a category going into it, uh, or once we know what's left, if there's something that we really think should be there, we can call it and put our own choice in. Uh, and of course, we're going to get a chance to talk about our nominees and the different things and why we put them up there. Uh, so yeah, it'll be a fun discussion, a, a different way to discuss films this year than some of the other episodes. So with that said, are we ready, guys? Yep. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. We're just going to start at the bottom and work our way up. Uh, and we are going to begin with the best original song category. Uh, it's the first one we're going to start with. Now, for most of these categories, I do have graphics to throw up there just to show these guys' films. Uh, but unfortunately, the ones I made for the song and score categories did not save. So just bear with us uh, with all the talking. It'll get much easier with the pictures in just a little bit. Uh, but Jacob, I'll go ahead and start with you, man. So go ahead and throw out for me, what are your nominees for best original song? Yeah, so my let me scroll down real quick. I've got it open. Um, so my my nominees were Peaches from the Super Mario Brothers movie, uh, I'm Just Ken from Barbie, uh, Am I Dreaming from Across the Spider uh, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse, Quiet Eyes from Past Lives, and What Was I Made for from Barbie. All right, uh, and then was there is there any in particular you wanted to talk about? Uh, I so when I was given the opportunity to uh, you know pick a couple categories, I immediately went to best original song just because I wanted to shout out Jack Black and and Peaches uh, because well sure it's not the best lyrically written song, um, <laughs> dang it is it fun <laughs> and part of me just wanted to see Jack Black up on that Oscar stage performing Peaches. You know, dressed as as Bowser or whatever, um, and so yeah, I I just I I wanted to recognize Jack Black just for the the, the great musician he is, um, and also shout out to his uh, version of Baby One More Time because it, it it's incredible. I literally just heard that before I brought you guys into the call. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. That, that... Shout out to Jack Black in general, man. That guy's a national treasure. Yes. Oh, all right. I'm in between sneezes. Malcolm, I'll go to you next, man. Who are your nominations for best original song? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for, for me, uh, you'll know um, that I love the songs from a Specifically, one movie. We're not to say, but um, I what was I made for from Barbie? Then I had you've never had chocolate like this from Wonka, Scrub Scrub from Wonka, and Sweet Tooth also from Wonka, and then Live That Way for, Forever from the Iron Claw, um, which is um composed by um, and actually the score is composed by one of the singers of a band called Arcade Fire, um, which I didn't realize then. Yeah. Um, but it's but but um that song at the end of the Iron Claw, I I think was um a really good song sort of describing how a legacy of um of someone can live forever and all, all that and um and i just really loved um the songs along i thought they were great um like some people um don't like them but i do <laughs> 
Yeah, I I would say the the songs in Wonka. I guess my like my thoughts on them. They were enjoyable within the context of the film, but I'd be lying if I said I had any strong memory of them o- outside of just the repetition of Scrub Scrub. Because at, at a certain point, that just becomes catchy. But like, if you ask me to try and sing one of them right now, I, I don't know if I could actually pull any of the tunes out of my head. That's fair. Yeah. Um, but they are, they are. They are fun songs for certain. Um, yeah, so then I'll go. Um, so I was going to say, I, I was deciding when I was going to bring this up in the intro or when I get to the nominees, so I guess I'll do it here. Uh, so because I knew I was bringing in the two people who would sort of have further reaching opinions, I decided to play this from a particular angle. So my choices for this evening are basically academy choices and by that i would mean just to sort of mix it up a little bit rather than just throwing in like my top 11 films or whatever over the course of the various different categories i legitimately did just kind of go by in past what the academy would sort of go for what i think they would go for if they were going to take a chance on something just to mix it up so for this category i actually opted to go to the shortlist which is uh they now publicly release the shortlists uh ahead of the nom- nominees being announced every year there's 15 songs that are put on a short list i went to the short list and listened through all 15 and decided from there what i wanted to put on the list uh so the ones that i went for were i'm just ken from barbie uh what was i made for from barbie both of which were nominated uh, another one that was actually nominated at the show, I believe, uh, Road to Freedom from Rustin, uh, Lenny Kravitz. Uh, and then the other two I did were Meet in the Middle, which was from the musical Floor and Sun, and Can't Catch Me Now from the Hunger Birds, uh, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Oh. Um, so with, with all three of those out there, of course, we have uh, two already in there for Best Original Song. I'm Just Ken and What Was I Made For. What Was I Made For was on all three of our lists. I'm Just Ken made two of ours, so that is automatically going to find its way in. Um, And so, of course, because we have three nominations missing, that means going by the We Get Five the whole show, each one of us is going to get to put a song in here. So, Jacob, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, what th- what song would you like to put in? I'm I'm throwing peaches in there. I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so catchy. Why, why, I was gonna say white peaches, but I I feel like uh, I feel like that's obvious. I was gonna say <laughs> talking about your nominations for a second. Probably the hardest cut for me when deciding mine was "Am I Dreaming," which was on the short list. I wanted to put it on there. Yeah. But I, I feel like I feel like I enjoy that album on a whole more than any one individual song I think is strong enough to like be nominated, if that makes sense. I feel like it, yeah, no, it does and doesn't. Yeah. yeah, there were there were a few songs I could have picked from uh the the Spider Verse soundtrack. Um it was between like, like the two two of my favorites that one and then um Calling, I yeah. think is also really good. Mm. Yeah. Uh God, what's the I'm trying to think of what's the one that has James Blake on the intro? Is it something communication? Oh. I can't remember offhand, but yeah, like I don't know. I like obviously that, that I love that soundtrack just like I love the first one, but I feel like I ju- like I just listen to it as a collective. There's not like one particular song where I'd be like, yeah, that's Oscar worthy. But like as a soundtrack overall, I think it's stronger than the entirety of the Barbie soundtrack, which has like three, four maybe standout songs, and then the rest are just kind of eh, okay. Right. I, I think I think I could agree with that. All right. So Peaches is going to go in for Jacob. Malcolm, I'll go to you, sir. What song are you throwing on the list? Well, that discussion can be at some time to think. <laughs> This, as much as I would like to put um, one of the Wonka songs in, I think Live That Way Forever is probably the better song, so Live That Way Forever from the Iron Core. All right, let me get that. All right. 
and just make sure I have it. You said uh, live that way forever from the Iron Claw, right? Yeah. The Iron Claw, I'll just throw this out right away because it will come up later in the show at some point. The Iron Claw, probably the only major film that was nominated or snubbed that I didn't get to this year. So, uh... yeah, having and like it left theaters before I could get to it, and it's not come out really anywhere else yeah. since, probably because didn't get Oscar nominations. So they were just like, ah, we'll wait. <laughs> I mean, I think it just recently came out in digital. Either that or is it soon to be coming out shortly. I'd imagine it will be coming out soon. Um, I, I, the only reason I say that, I've been seeing ads on Facebook saying it's coming out soon. <laughs> yeah, for things like this, I think I, I, I would trust Facebook. Um, all right, so... All right, cool. So that is four of the songs. So that means I'll go. I don't know. I. All right. I, I, I think I'm going to put the song from Floor and Sun in there. I don't know. Have either of you seen the film? Just out of sheer I curiosity. I, I have. Um, the music didn't do anything for me, to be honest. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I so uh, the song in the context of the film, it's I guess it would be the the main sort of romantic duet uh, between Eve Hewson, more famously known as Bono's daughter, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I think the thing that shocked me most about this movie is that Joseph Gordon-Levitt can sing. Uh, mm. I mean, maybe he's done it elsewhere, and I just didn't know, but I, I didn't realize he could sing, uh, which was just kind of a cool thing to see. Um, but I feel like the like a, a big centerpiece of the film is the fact that these two characters have a romance essentially through Skype because they're on two opposite sides of the world. And the fact that they as performers have enough chemistry that you buy into the romance with this song sort of being the centerpiece of it. Uh, I think to me it has the most impact of the songs that are left. Although I would give a very strong honorable mention to Road to Freedom, uh, which has obviously Lenny Kravitz. It's got a, a, a like a, a jazz sort of background, and it's just a really great sounding song. Um, but in terms of impact on the film, I think I would put this one in. So... That will be the category. So we have I'm Just Ken from Barbie. What was I made for from Barbie? We we can all agree that's probably going to win, right? At this point, it looks pretty set in stone. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like she's, she's won pretty much everywhere. Which can I just say, I, I get why I'm Just Ken's not going to win, but I'm kind of disappointed that it's not. Not because I want I'm Just Ken to win an Oscar. I, I don't care. I just think it sucks that uh, the two guys who put together most of the album, Mark Ronson and I forget the other gentleman's name, but uh, they're not going to get the Oscar connected to that album. It's going to go to Billie Eilish because they sourced that song in from her. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, you know, it is what it is. It's not like Mark Ronson hasn't won an Oscar. He won one for yeah. uh, A Star is Born. So he's not losing anything for this. It's just kind of funny that like they source like one or two songs in from elsewhere and that one goes to win an Oscar. And I'm sure he'll get another one at some point. <laughs> oh, for, for sure. If Lady Gaga ever sings in a film, she's going to get that team back. Like, let's win an Oscar again. I, I mean, and, and it's one of those ones like, because um, apparently the song from Killers of Flower Moon is actually um, getting a lot of votes too, which hmm. hasn't, which hasn't, wasn't nominated anywhere else apart from the Oscars. So. No. Um, and listen, I think that's awesome. Like, I, I think it's really cool to shout out. Uh, to shout that out but yeah i oh i mean i i i, totally, I agree with you i don't think it's going to beat billy eilish but strange things have happened so. it i don't want to say it because i sound like an asshole but i it, it feels a little bit like maybe that song got nominated just because people felt good about doing it because if I'm being honest, and this is just me being honest, I could not have told you there was a, a proper song in Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, I yeah. did have to actively go back and be like, what was that? Yeah. Um, but that's just me. 
I, again, I, I could just be an asshole. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, it's just intriguing to me. Uh, all right. So we feel good about that. We'll go ahead and jump over to the next one, uh, which is going to be best original score. Uh, we'll go ahead and get into this. And Malcolm, I'm actually going to go to you first on this one. We'll rotate throughout here. So I want you to give me who are your nominees for best original score? Uh, my nominees for best original score is um, The Holdovers, The Iron Claw, Four Things, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse, and Oppenheimer. Um, and it, like, there's not really much to say about them. Like, Oppenheimer got. Oh, no, it was Oppenheimer and Poor Things both got the nominated at the Oscars, and I just think this what they did with Poor Spider Verse was really good. So yeah, yeah, I, I would uh, agree with that. Uh, I'll go ahead and put mine out there next. Uh, so for me, my nominees would be uh, three of which were nominated at the Oscars: uh, uh. Jerskin Fendrix uh, for Poor Things, uh, Ludwig Gorenson for Oppenheimer, uh, then the two that weren't nominated. Uh, I'm going to butcher this poor guy's name, but Joe Hisaishi uh, for The Boy and the Heron, Daniel Pemberton for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Robbie Robertson for Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, score, to me, is such a tough thing to judge because... There's a lot of great compositions in film, and then there's great compositions that you can actually remember. Um, and I, I feel like that, to me, is the next level up. Uh, to me, these were the scores that stood out the most. These were the scores where, during the movie, I'm actively going, man, that's, like, really good music. You know, listen, John Williams, you're a legend, man. That indie score was nothing but you running out of greatest hits of Sound Alikes. Like... <laughs> I don't know why you're nominated, but congrats. I hope you enjoy the night. Uh, but yeah, for me, the, those five were the, the top notches. Uh, so Jacob, then on to you, man. Uh, who are your nominees and any extra thoughts you have? Yeah, so my nominees are uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Um, how it didn't get nominated is still beyond me. I thought it was the best score of the year. Um, I have Oppenheimer. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, Poor Things, and The Holdovers. Uh, and, and Poor Things was was a late edition, actually. Um, I had another movie in its spot, and then I saw that Poor Things was streaming on Hulu. It's one that I missed in theater, so I checked it out last night and then um, <laughs> sent uh, sent Aaron some, some replacements. Um, and this, <laughs> this was one of them because um, I, I think it's such a unique score, and the movie is so weird and, and not in a mm. bad way either um not, not not in a bad way it's just um when you hear what the movie is about and when you're talking about the movie you're like oh yeah no no I, I i get why people would call it like a weird movie um and, and the score i think just fit it perfectly um so yeah no i i again i i didn't look up names like like aaron did i'm not as prepared but whoever can no you're that, good you're I, good i i, did, I, I didn't ask stuff. you guys too so, no, that that's just me. Uh, yeah, and so this is actually one of the a couple categories I said. There were some categories where we had very little crossover, and then there were some categories where we actually sorted out the nominations just through us, and this was one of those categories. Uh, so the five nominees for the show, based on our collab non-collaborative collaborating, I guess you would say, are... Jerskin Fendrix for Poor Things, Ludwig Gorenson for Oppenheimer, Mark Orton for The Holdovers, Daniel Pemberton for Sp Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Robbie Robertson for Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, yeah, the uh, the Poor Things is, is a particularly intriguing one because I was sat there trying to think if I had ever heard anything like this. And then I started, like, because I, I just naturally do this for things, I started, like, actually looking into the movie and into the different people who worked on it. Uh, Jerskin Fendrix is a 28-year-old musician out of somewhere in Europe who had never composed a film. 
This is his first movie. Wow. I don't know how Yorgos Lanthimos found him. I don't know what his musical background is. His Wikipedia is about as bare as it can possibly get, but he does exist. He is a musician, and this is his first movie. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, for, well, first credit, not even just first movie, is IMDb is literally just this, uh, which is incredibly impressive because, again, not only is it excellent, it's unique as hell. Yeah. Um, which I, I, you know, again, it's it's something that you appreciate. Uh, all right. So, again, very brief one. It's harder to, to talk in depth about music. I, I'm definitely trying. Uh, is there any other thoughts you guys have? Or are we ready to move on? No. I, I would have preferred this five. <laughs> All right, so let's ju yeah, just anyone over John Williams. I really don't care who. Just it, it's just such an odd, like that is a Meryl Streep for Into the Woods style nomination of mm -hmm. like ah, John did something this year. I mean, ultimately, um, it wasn't going to matter anyway because I mean, it, it's I think it's clearly going to Oppenheimer as it anyway. <laughs> oh, for, yeah. It, I I would genuinely be shocked if anyone aside from Oppenheimer takes this. Um, yeah. yeah, but seriously, still, guy. Why why do we nominate John? Anyways, moving on to something that doesn't involve John Williams. Uh, let's move into best animated, uh, best animated film. Uh, of of course a. A category that for a long time looked like it was going to be a, you know, a one horse race. And a lot of people seem to think that the boy in the heron is picking up enough steam that it might win. Uh, Malcolm, again, you're a little more tapped into that than me. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's definitely between Boy in the Heron and Spyverse. They've both sort of um, been neck and neck. Like, um, Spyverse got um, EGA, and, um, but Boy in the Heron got BAFTA and. Um, and Globe, so it's like it could, it's, it's at the point where it could still legit be anyone, so yeah. Uh, so and then I, I have another uh note to talk about at the end of the, uh, this, but I'll talk about it at the end of the category. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump in. I do have the pictures starting here, so it'll be easier to follow for people. Uh, so I'll go my nominees first. My five for best animated feature are The Boy and the Heron. Uh, Elemental, Nimona, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Uh, for me, this isn't even, like, a, I forgot I have this, I can split it so we can do that. Uh, this isn't even a question for me. Uh, it's Spider-Man that should win. Um, in fact, The Boy and the Heron was kind of the coin flip one. I was between that and another anime film that came out last year, uh, Suzume. Uh, I went with Boy and the Heron because ultimately I think it has a little bit more emotional resonance. But he, first off, last year was a great year for animation. And secondly, seriously, how is anything competing with Spider-Verse? I don't understand. Uh, Jacob, you're up next, man. Yeah, and so um, these... As I as I looked over um, my my just overall list that, that I was keeping track of, um, these happen to be the only five animated movies that I saw from last year. There were quite a few that I missed. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but I do have I have Spider Man Across the Spider Verse. I have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Mutant Mayhem. I have the Super Mario Brothers movie, Elemental, and Nimona. Um, <clears throat> and Nimona kind of grew on me as as the year went on. Uh, upon that first watch, I was like, okay, that was that was good. Uh, but then the more it sat with me, and the more I thought about it, I was like, oh no, that this is a this is a really good movie, really really good animation. Um, but yeah, no, I I agree. Like this is this is Spider versus <laughs> a War to Lose, in my opinion. I I see. I haven't seen The Boy and the Heron yet. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it just wasn't playing anywhere near me. Uh, so I just didn't get the chance, but um, I am a pretty big Studio Ghibli fan, so I'm looking forward to watching it when it does come out. Um, and I don't think you could ever count Miyazaki out when it comes to 
<laughs> animation. I mean, he's, he's made some pretty stellar films. So um, if it does win, I wouldn't be surprised, um, but I would be like a little disappointed because I absolutely love Spider-Verse. Yeah, fair. Uh, so I'll go ahead then and transfer it over to Malcolm. What are your nominees, sir? Um, yeah, these are probably the only five um, anime movies I actually watched this year as well. Um, I, but my nominations is um, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Leo, Super Mario Brothers, Elemental, and DC Legion of Superheroes. Um, and, yeah, I know DC Legion of Superheroes um, – Probably wouldn't have been nominated the Aussies well because it was it was a straight DVD. <laughs> um, but um, but um, yeah, I I I I put Leo as a lot of fun. I've, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and yeah, I I just never go around seeing Boy in the Hair, and and it's one of those ones. It wouldn't surprise me if people voted Boy in the Hair because they knew five the first five verse had already won, so they wanted to, to give. Something else had shot, uh, but mm. I wouldn't be too disappointed if it goes either, either way. So, yeah, I, I think you bring up a great point. I think that's like the one big thing going against Spider Verse right now is which. Uh, so, everything that's been said from the man himself, this is not Miyazaki's last film. He does have at least one more idea he wants to make. But people seem to think that this is his last movie. Like, a lot of the public are discussing about it like it is another one of his last films. Um, and Spider-Verse, obviously, the first one won an award, and we know there's a third one coming. Um, and I've made this point before when talking about Oscars. I do think the Spider-Verse films are legitimately good enough that they could contend in other categories, like a screenplay or a best picture. But... I don't think it's going to happen until a third film because I think the Academy is just dismissive in that manner. Like, I think they will just genuinely put it off and be like, ah, we'll reward the third one because it's the last. Whereas I wouldn't be shocked if it did lose the award because of that. Um, mm -hmm. That said, Boy Maharan is still fifth of those five for me. So I still don't think it should win. But hey, whatever happens, happens. Uh, yeah, I, I hope it's not his last film because uh, I... If this is his last film, then I would have told him to stay in retirement because I personally love The Wind Rises. That's a hell of a last movie to go out on to make essentially an animated biopic. And um, yeah. I just found this one to be, a, you know, emotionally resonant, sure. And I get what he's going for, but I just found it a little muddled personally. Um, but yeah, so again, for the second category in a row, uh, this category was sorted simply by our nominations uh and it's actually exactly what jacob suggested uh so you only saw five animated films but by our <laughs> metric you saw the five uh elemental nimona spider verse uh super mario brothers and teenage mutant ninja turtles those are the five um the one thing i did want to point out because there's one of the films nominated that a lot of people have had confusion at which is robot dreams uh a film that qualified for the academy awards through festival screenings at least here in the u.s through festival screenings i'm not sure of the nature of its international release malcolm i don't know if it maybe it did release uh, internationally that you're aware of i mean if it has i haven't seen it yet, so i think it comes okay. out this year as well um but it's not set for a U.S. release until May, which is certainly not the norm for something like this. Um, I actually had the incredible luck to get to see a screening of it on Wednesday. Uh, there was a one-off screening held at an indie theater near me, and I had the opportunity to go to it. Um, so I have seen the movie. I'm, as far as I know, the only person I know who's actually seen the film. Um Here's what I'll say about it, because a lot of people are kind of confused as to how a film no one's seen is nominated for Best Animated Feature. It is very good. Uh, it's simplistic. It's dialogue-free. The entire thing is just animation. Um, and I think that it's... I think it's a really cute film. Like, I think little kids who have not seen anything more artistic will get into it. Um, it's got some good slapstick. It's got some good visual humor. But I think it just goes on for a little too long. At least that's my view on it. 
Uh, I think it may it would have been better if it was a shorter feature film or uh, if it were a uh, a short film itself. Uh. Um, just because, and I, I don't want to spoil too much, obviously, because it's literally not out anywhere. But the the premise of it, I can say this and be spoiler free. The the premise of it is. Uh, a uh, in in a world of uh, anthropomorphic animals, a lonely dog orders and builds a robot so that he has a friend, and is then separated from that robot. Uh, and the majority of the film is cutting back and forth between the dog dealing with the loneliness again of not having his friend around, and the robot who powered down and and died. Uh, but is stuck in a singular place that the dog can't get to. Uh, sort of, I guess, fantasizing would be the, the word for it. Sort of fantasizing about what life could be aside from just being stuck in this place. Um, and again, it's, it's really inventive, but I just think it's a little repetitive after a certain point because there's only so much you can do with the premise. Um, so would I nominate it over any of the films we discussed tonight? Honestly, no. But that said, it's super artistic, so I I actually get why it is nominated. And I'd say it's on the level if just below what was nominated. Uh, but take that from someone talking about a film you guys won't see for like three more months. <laughs> and, that's, and that's if it even releases near you because it's being distributed by Neon who don't generally do wide releases. So even when it releases yeah. in three months, you, the, the people still may not be able to see this thing. I don't know what the release is going to look like. Unless it wins an Oscar, in which case everyone's going to see it. True. Uh, all right. So, unless you guys have any other comments. Nope. Nope. All right. Let's get into some of the meteor ones. Let's go to best adapted screenplay. All right. So, best adapted screenplay. Jacob, uh, we'll rotate back around to you, sir. Go ahead and give me your nominees for Best Adapted Screenplay. Yeah, my nominees uh, for Adapted are uh, Oppenheimer, uh, Barbie, Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Poor Things. Um I, yeah, um, I just I thought the dialogue was was really heavy, uh, really strong in Spider Verse, um, and uh, just I, I, I also just really love the movie. Um, so any chance I got to to nominate it, I I took that that opportunity. Um, again, I just saw Poor Things last night, but it kind of it kind of um, made an impression and. Uh, yeah, I think just some of the writing um, for Emma Stone's character specifically was just really good. Um, yeah, I think these other three. I think these other three movies have been talked about a lot. Like, it's just I think it's just some some really good writing. There's some pretty great monologues in Barbie, um, and then Oppenheimer is just epic. Um, I expect it to win quite a few awards uh when when, when at, at the oscars so all right uh then we'll go ahead and go over to yourself malcolm who are your nominees um yeah i mean the screenplay categories in general for last year have been in a bit of contention due to certain movies and all that. Um, and you'll see, uh, understand why I left one off adapted, um, because I don't consider it adapted personally. But um, for me, for what I've got for adapted, I've got, I've got Wonka, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and Guns of the Galaxy Volume 3. Um, and it's one of those ones, like Dungeons and Dragons was a big surprise. Um, I mean, I think the writing um, it, it, in itself was um, was great, and um, and yeah, and it's just one of those ones like it definitely felt like it was a 
completely improv does a dragon's adventure um and yeah and um and it's one of those in Guardians of the Galaxy what while it is an original story it is still adapted because it's based on a comic book and all that um and um and it's I've never had an issue with James Gunn's scripts um I think he's he always finds a way to make a good really thing then um and I thought Wonka was a lot of fun um I I thought it was it was well worth it written and it's one of those ones like if there's any sequels, it may, it may show how he gets to sort of where we see him in Willy Wonka, but yeah. All right, so we have those there, and then I'll go ahead and throw mine up there. Uh, so my nominees were American Fiction, uh, Oppenheimer, Origin, Poor Things and Spider Man Across the Spider Verse. Uh, yeah, again, uh, Poor Things, uh, American Fiction. Personally, for me, I'd actually give the win to American Fiction. I think it does have the best screenplay of the year. Uh, Poor Things, American Fiction, Oppenheimer, all there for the same reason, which is just, I think, in terms of adapted screenplays, they have the strongest dialogue, the most engaging dialogue. The writing just keeps you locked into the film. Uh, in terms of the other two, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, I mean, I have no qualms about saying it. I think it m might be the best written comic book film ever. Like, it, it is genuinely, it's it's in contention with, like, I guess you'd put, like, The Dark Knight up there and Logan. But, like, it, that's really it that I think is better. In, in terms of the writing, in terms of the character development, in terms of the way the movie plays itself out... I think it is one of the strongest written comic book films ever made. Uh, and Origin, which I know is a movie a lot of people didn't get to see because of its release structure, it kind of got an Iron Claw situation where it was released just very poorly. Um, Ava DuVernay with this movie adapts a book that was a nonfiction book and transfers it into a narrative story. But she also keeps the nonfiction elements of the book because the movie is about the woman researching the book that she wrote. Uh, and I think that that's such a complicated transfer to take what is essentially a nonfiction information dump and turn it into not just a compelling movie, but a compelling movie that still gets the point of the book itself across is such a tricky situation. Um that it just it, it heavily heavily impressed me uh so that brings us to the nominations uh because currently we have three films that qualified we have oppenheimer poor things and spider-man across the spider-verse were nominated multiple times by us uh that which leaves two slots open uh so with that said, is there anyone that immediately wants to make sure one of their films gets on the list? That's not already there. Um, I'll probably say Dads and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves. Um, but yeah. All right, so Malcolm's going to use one of his. I, I'm also going to jump in. Uh, I mean, I, I literally said it. I, I personally think American Fiction, another one that hasn't had, like, the widest of releases. So, again, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see it. I personally think it was the best written film of the year uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, so I 100% would want it on this list. So I, I'm happy to... Huh? I was going to say, without seeing the movie, I've actually predicted that to win the, the Oscar. I mean, there was a strong chance it could cause the ups, an upset in upset Oppenheimer because um, I, I did win BAFTA um, for script screenplays. So yeah, and I just I think yeah. Oppenheimer is stronger in more places than than the screenplay. Yeah. I 100% agree with you. I, I think, and, I, and when I say this, I don't mean it as, like, the insult that it may sound like. I genuinely think that the weakest parts of most of Nolan's films are the screenplays. 
I just don't think he's the strongest script writer. I think he's a good enough script writer that he can get out what he needs and then translate it into a brilliant film. Uh, but I often find the films that he makes that rely the most upon having a super compelling screenplay, uh, namely for me, something like Interstellar, are his weakest films. Uh, the films where it is more about the filmmaking itself, like a Dunkirk, for example, I think stand out as stronger. Um, now, that's a, that shouldn't be confused for being a bad dialogue writer, because Oppenheimer is mostly dialogue, and I think that he pulls that off. But in terms of overall screenplay, I've never thought that he's the strongest writer. I, um, I will add, you know, I think I think Oppenheimer is probably his strongest di- um, like script movie that he's probably done. So I'd say strongest script on his own. I, I think, and again, I'd have to go back and double check uh, which ones he co-wrote with him. But I think his brother is a better writer. I think his strongest scripts are the ones where Jonathan Nolan is often involved. And he hasn't been involved the last few, not really since the Batman movies. Um, but you're right. I, I, I would say that this is probably the best one he's written on his own. Um, but I'd still say American fiction is better. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I mean, Jacob, you know, obviously not a conventional pick for the Oscars. What are your thoughts on, on the screenplay, though? No, I... I can understand the love for it um i i did really like this movie and like malcolm said it was a big surprise i think the humor in this movie was was really strong and i think it came across in in the dialogue but there were also just like good emotional moments as well and i i think there's strong writing here um and yeah not not one that i thought of um but one that i can understand um when it comes to screenplay Yeah, uh, funny enough, I actually did think of it. Uh, sorry, it looks like I'm freezing up. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, yeah. you're good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I thought I was freezing up for a sec. Uh, yeah, I, I actually did have it. I have a big ass honorable mentions list, which I'll uh, I may run down at the end of the show. Again, not something I asked you guys to do. It was just the way that I sort of put everything together. Dungeons and Dragons did genuinely make my honorable men- uh, honorable mentions list. I think of all the big action blockbusters like it that came out this year. I actually think it was the smartest written. I think the dialogue is really strong. I think the way the movie plays out, I guess, sort of the adventure. I feel like and I'm not the most experienced D&D player, so I can be corrected if I'm wrong. I feel like it does actually genuinely play like a D&D adventure. Like, I feel like it plays out in a great manner. Uh, and it's got really unique characters too. Yeah, from everything I know about D and D, because I'm not I'm not a, a, guy, a guy who plays it either. But from from what I've heard, um, it's it's pretty close. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. It, I I have, I have played D and D a lot, um, and yeah, and it's one of those ones like. Uh, that um, they actually played D and D before they thought started filming um, to get the characters and that um, sorted so with the cast. So. Yeah, I, I can believe it. Like it, it feels like the characters are, are especially um, uh, uh, Rajon Page's character. Like the the is it the paladin? Is right? Is that his name? Or that's his character yeah. type, I believe. Yeah, like the yeah. way that that is just in and out and the way that his character acts, it, it feels true to what I've heard about Dungeons and Dragons and like the way people will create these sort of like almost goofy characters, but in a way that works. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's intriguing. Uh, all right, so... Unless we have anything else to add, we can move on to the next screenplay category, which is going to be Best Original Screenplay. Uh, And Malcolm, I'll go ahead and throw it to you first on this one once again. What were your nominees for Best Original Screenplay? Yeah, for me, um, for Best Original Screenplay, I went The Holdovers, Barbie, The Iron Claw, Missing and talk to me. Um, as well as ones like for me personally, um, 
even though yes um like the oscars are treating barbie as adapted and it's been a point of contention <laughs> for a lot of people to me it's it's more of an original story set using the barbie ip because it's not quite directly based on like a barbie movie or thing it's just using the toys and bringing it to life but um but I mean, it's one of those ones like I get everyone's perspective on Barbie with its original adapted, um, and um, and I think once again the Iron Claw I think it was just perfect, um, and yeah, and it's and um, I wanted to give some love to Talk to Me because I think Talk to Me is a really smart horror movie, which is great, and um, the fact that it was made by just people who who make YouTube videos for a thing was just kind of inspiring to think that it's like well if we get our own together we can make a movie ourselves um and uh, missing i just think is a great concept um, but yeah yeah obviously uh on, honestly like your entire bottom three i i just didn't catch uh talk to me horror movies are just a general blind spot uh so i never caught it uh Missing, I think I actually booked tickets to go see it at one point and then had to cancel. And obviously, Iron Claw, I already talked about. Um, but yeah, Bar Barbie's an, an interesting one. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more when we come to the discussion on the nominees. Uh, I'll transfer it over to mine, I guess. Uh, so my nominees are uh, Air, uh, Anatomy of a Fall, uh, Fair Play, Flora and Son, and The Holdovers. Uh, which, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, a couple of different ones there. Uh, Fair Play, Florence Son in particular, not nominated or, or really any contention with the Academy. Uh, again, for me, when I think of a screenplay award, I, I, I think of something that's either like on a technical level is executed so intensely well that it makes the movie or I think of strong dialogue. Um, and I think that all of these have Honestly, for the most part, both of those things in common. I, I think all these movies have really smart dialogue. I think the dialogue keeps you engrossed in it. You know, e even for example, Air, I think is a screenplay that's really, really well written from a rookie screenwriter because it's a movie where you know the result. I mean, Air Jordan is one of the biggest fucking brands in the world still. Like, you know the ending of this movie, and yet they do get you to a point where you're engrossed in are they going to sign him? Which I think is a really impressive feat. Um, uh, again, my personal pick for the award this year uh, for original screenplay would go to Anatomy of a Fall. Uh, I, I just think it's it's a legal courtroom drama slash investigation into this murder that I think is, you know, for for again, for a courtroom drama that's three hours long, uh, which I know Oppenheimer is also technically sort of a courtroom drama that's three hours long, but an Anatomy of a Fall also does a great job of holding your attention, but in, in a totally different way, because, you know, with Oppenheimer, it's more of an analysis of the person, of the character. Anatomy of a Fall is genuinely a mystery without being a mystery, because the situation on the outset does seem pretty cut and dry, but the movie does a great job of playing with your mind and making you believe that she could have killed him. Like, I don't know, you don't, like, there's a lot about her behavior that makes you want to believe she didn't, but, like, the movie also really sells you on the idea that she could have, and it makes a mystery out of something that seems very cut and dry, uh, which I appreciate, uh, because, it, again, it does keep you engaged the whole time. Uh, and The Holdovers is just one of the sweetest films I've seen in a long time. I mean, I know Alexander Payne had a weird problem with it being defined as a Christmas film, but... I think that's a compliment. <laughs> the fact that people want to associate the movie with like the holidays and family and warm feelings. Like I, I just think that obviously he didn't write it, but it, I think that it's a, a hell of a film and that starts with the screenplay. Uh, so then Jacob on to you, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to agree. Cause I also have the holdovers, but I also have past lives, maestro air and the iron claw. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said about Air, because, yeah, like, I know the story. I, I know about the shoe. But even towards the end, I was like, wait, are they going to get him? <laughs> did, did we miss something here? Like, 
did he sign somewhere else? And then I'm like, ah, maybe not. Let me out of my contract, and I'm going to sign with Nike now. Um, so like they did, yeah, they did a really good job with with the screenplay and and really, you know, <clears throat> uh, the holdovers, like you said, is is just a, it's a really sweet film. Um, I think the growth of Paul Giamatti's character is really good. Um, I I appear to be higher on Maestro than. Than, than most people um I, I i think it's it's a really good movie um and then just like the, the holdovers is a sweet movie i think past lives is also a sweet movie for for different reasons um I, and i think the the screenplay is is really strong here um I don't, I don't and i know it's nominated for best picture too but i still feel like it's a little uh underseen so i would i would Highly recommend it. I think it's streaming on Paramount now, so I would recommend. Checking yeah, out. I think I think it was one of the last films as a part of A24's deal with Showtime, so that would put it on Paramount. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you're. Yeah, it, it feels weird to say that the movie's underseen because, like, the whole story around it was like this incredible box office run for an indie film, but like also, yeah, probably generally it was pretty underseen. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. We were doing, we were doing the, I think we were doing the top 12 over on, on Malcolm's channel. And I think I was the only yes. one to bring it up. And I don't think other people even had it in their honorable mentions. And so for, either for, I'm just higher on it or it was just not seen by the rest of the panel. I mean, I, I think it was. A, Sorry, good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's best to have. I think it might be just a case of um, you're high on it, higher on it than others. Because um, like I, I did see it, but um, I think I saw it before um, there. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, like I, I thought it was fine. Like, um, but it was just uh, my top twelve are just that strong mm. for me that I just it just. Um, I think it just ended up in the middle of my pack because I think a lot of my movies last year was like five, four and a half stars. But I gave Past Lives a four, 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 four out of five. I thought it was fine. So, yeah, yeah for, for what it's worth, because that, that was the show where my computer died on me, so I wound up missing it. Uh, past, so, but my, my, if I had been on the actual show, my approach going into that show would have been obviously I'm going to present my, my top 12 first, but if something was in my top 20, I was going to say yes because. If it's in my top 20, I don't know why I would fight it to try and get my specific top 12 on there. So I would have said yes to past lives. It's in my top 20. I think it's it's on the lower end, to be fair, um, only because I just, in terms of dialogue-driven films, they're just, the hook wasn't there compared to some of the others I saw this year. But that said, it is it is really well written, and for being just three actors, they really do suck you into this story that they're building. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. It, it's really strong. Um, all right, so that means we'll go into the selection here. Uh, best original screenplay. Off our picks, three films make it onto the list automatically. We have Air, we have The Holdovers, which all three of us suggested, and we have Iron Claw that make it. Uh, so with that said, uh, is there anyone who wants to sort of put themselves up first for a selection? Jacob, you obviously have one more than us, but it's your call if you want to jump on it. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to throw Past Lives in there. Or past no, Lives, no. right? Yeah, yeah, Past Lives. I was going to say, in terms of what's what's nominated that you don't have there already, it'd be Maestro or Past Lives. Yeah, Past Lives. I have that... Uh, at two, I, I yeah, and real quick while you're typing that, I do, I do find it funny that Barbie was, you know, is is a toy and is like a character, um, but the Iron Claw is able to be in, uh, original screenplay and it's something that you know actually happened and you know Dude, whether man. or not like you, you, yes you've got real people but they're also portraying characters it's it, it's just I think it's you're you're um, yeah you're right. So oh, Barbie, just going, Barbie. just quickly going. <laughs> oh, jump um, in, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the Iron Claw, it isn't specifically based on a book about the um, 
the, because I think the way the Oscars do adapted in the original, if it's directly based on a book about that person, yes. then it counts as ad- adapted, which is, and because that's why Maestro was an original as well for the Oscars. Um, because that that's the one I've kind of got the attention with that was not at the Oscar level. To me, it, it should be. Like to me, biopics should be adapted because even though they're not directly based on a book, but it is what it is. Like, yeah, that's my thing. It's like it's it's adapted from something. Like, yeah, right. You're you're taking from someone's life to put this together, but right. it is still an adaptation. I wish it could be the same thing for for air. Yeah, yeah, air air could be as well. Yeah, it's which it, it that's why it's so odd to me that Barbie did wind up being accredited as adapted because to me Barbie falls under the same jurisdiction as, as like biopics. It's like yeah, okay, it's based on a doll that exists and there are characters that are in there, but like it's not taking a story from something. Yeah, yeah, because it's one of those. Well, I was going to say, like, the, the justification somebody gave me was, like, because of the way they're accrediting the adaptation, it's the equivalent of, like, when Logan was nominated for Adapted, and they said, like, based on the Marvel character, which I get, but also Logan is a like, a character from a written piece, so inherently yeah. there are going to be elements of the character drawn from the comics, it's just they didn't name a particular one. So it's based on the character, not a particular comic. Yeah. Who is Barbie, the character in the doll? Can anybody tell me? <laughs> Can the Oscars tell me who <laughs> the character of Barbie is? Yeah, but I mean, Barbie's been that funny one because, like, the BAFTAs considered the original, WGK considered the original. Um... I think some of the random girls had it adapted, but it's like it's been all over the place. All, all things like they all need to get together, kind of na- nail down like a specific definition for both categories. True. Uh, so now, so Jacob's put uh, a screenplay in. I guess Jacob, technically, Jacob, you could also vouch for uh, a second one if you wanted. But Malcolm, do you have one you want to throw in there or no? You know what? I'll throw and talk to me. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that's a good one. I think of all the the horror movies that I've seen from from the year, I think Talk to Me ha- does have a really strong screenplay, and I think it's I think one of the best written horror movies of the year. So I I, 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 I can appreciate that. So there we go. So the nominees for Best Original Screenplay are Air, The Holdovers, The Iron Claw, and then Past Lives and Talk to Me. You heard it here first, folks. Barbie, not a nominated screenplay because of Oscar politics. Because <laughs> you guys had it split and I did not nominate it. <laughs> I like Barbie. I think Greta should have got a direction nomination, as we'll see in just a moment. I think the screenplay is the weakest part of the movie, frankly. So, mm. uh, but hey, it, it is what it is. Unfortunately, because it is an adapted, it's got no hope in hell of winning. So, no, 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 no unfortunately, not anymore. Uh, all right, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next category, guys. Let's go to best supporting actress. Uh, I'll go ahead and head up first on this one. Um, this category for me might be the the one I realized I agree the least with when it came to the Oscars, because quite literally the only nominee I listed that is nominated at the actual award show is the one that's considered the front runner to win. I have four other picks than the Oscars came up with. Uh, so my picks for it are Viola Davis for Air, uh, Claire Foy for All of Us Strangers, Rachel McAdams for Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Niecy Nash Betts for Origin. And Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. Um, I could I could go on and on about the brilliant performances from all the women who weren't nominated at the Academy Awards. Uh, but let's be real. Divine Joy Randolph is going to win this award, and no one can stop her. Uh, 
Agreed. <laughs> that said, that said, uh, two of those films, All of a Stranger's Origin, are two of those. They came out at the end of the year, but weren't nominated for Oscars, so no one saw them films. So go check them out, uh, especially All of a Stranger's. That is in my top five of the year. Uh, I think it is an excellent, excellent film that is just underseen because of its release pattern. So please go check it out. Um, and then Rachel McAdams for you there, God, it's me, Margaret. This is one of my favorite films of the year. Uh, it's just, again, because I approach this from the, the point of view of like, how would the Oscars do it? I, I, it just eliminates it from a lot of categories. I have a hard time seeing them give a film like this best picture. I have a hard time seeing them give a young girl best actress. I cut it from the screenplay category as one of my final cuts. Uh, but Rachel McAdams stayed for me because I, I think she truly is the heart and soul of the film. Her performance is a mother who is just genuinely trying her best, but is stressed with everything that comes with moving and having a teenage daughter and everything else. Uh, and just struggling to be content with life i feel like it's such a mundane character that everyone can relate to it uh and she turns in an excellent performance uh so jacob i'll go to you next sir what do you got yeah so my nominees for best supporting actress are what i like to call the divine joy randolph category um yes. <laughs> is divine joy randolph for the holdovers um, America Ferreira and Barbie, I, I do really like her performance. Um, I think her and another nominee that I'll get to later are actually the, the my favorite part of the movie. Um, spoiler, it's not Barbie herself. Um, I also have Viola Davis in Air. She's not in the movie much, but when she is on screen, like she just demands your attention as, as Michael Jordan's uh, mother and... Man, I think some of it's weird. Some of her best performances are, in my opinion, the the performances where she's in the movie for like twenty minutes. But those are like the twenty minutes you remember the most. Um, and then uh, Emily Blunt in Oppenheimer. Um, I just I I think she gives a strong performance. And then um, I kind of wanted to you know throw throw a throw a curveball for my final pick. Um, so I went with Kayla Lane from uh, from Wonka. I think um, there were several several moments, um, there were several scenes where I thought she was the the best part, um, and that's working alongside Timothy Chalamet, who I think is you know just a really great young actor um, who I think can eventually win win an Oscar himself. But um, oh, for sure. yeah, I just I just wanted to show appreciation because yeah, I think this is one of her. I, I'm not 100%, but I don't think she's done a lot because um, I, I, I mean, I haven't heard of her until this movie. Yeah, she did The Day Shall Come in 2019, and then she's done Wonka. She's done short films and some, some television, but not a lot. And um, I think, you know, she, she puts in a, a pretty strong performance alongside Timothy Chalamet here. And like I said, I think, you know, sometimes when they're on screen together, I'm, you know, liking her performance more than his so it was more like I, I i appreciate the work you did yeah i mean at the at its core isn't that what the oscars is yeah all right anything else or are we good no we're good yeah no all right which means malcolm down to you i totally didn't speak to Cross over as much as I did with James, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, but I, I went um, to find Joy Randolph from the holdovers. I also went Keller Lane from Wonka. I also went America Pure of Barbie. Then I went Florence Pugh for Oppenheimer. I I thought she was better than Emily Blunt personally. And then I went Lily James for The Iron Claw. Um, oh. And yeah, pretty much like everything um, Jacob said about Keller Lane, like she was she was um, the heart and soul of that movie. She was. Um, great, and it's um, and like even for me, I know a lot of people like I oh, America yeah, Pure just got nominated because of her uh, monologue. I actually think she was great for the whole movie. Um, I actually really enjoyed um every time she was on screen. It, to me, it's not just because of the monologue, but then again, it's one of those ones like supporting actress this year was like there was one standout, which is Divine Joel Randolph. Then 
everyone else was just fighting to get in, get in that, those final four spots. Like it wasn't really that that strong of a category to begin with, because there really wasn't anyone else that was like um, that should should have been nominated. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and get to the nominees themselves. And we have four confirmed nominees from this category. Viola Davis makes it in. America Ferrera makes it in. Possibly the upset of the night as Kala Lane makes it in. And Davine Joy Randolph, of course, is also a part of the nominees. Uh, so we have one spot left open for whoever would like to vouch for one of their nominees making it. Four out of my five made it, so I'm good. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll throw my hat in. Why not? I'll, I'll throw one in. Um... Yeah, you know what? It, it's the one I talked about the most. So I'm going to throw Rachel McAdams in there. Uh, I, I think that, again, it's probably the least showy of all the performances nominated. You know, there, there's not as much flash or big character stuff going on. But I think it's the relatability of the performance. Um, also, just in general, like... Maybe it's just me, but what the hell has Rachel McAdams been in in the last few years, aside from this and Doctor Strange last year? Like, I genuinely cannot think of very many films that she's been in. And she's a very good actress, so to not be in a ton of films is just weird. I mean, it could just be the case of she was busy and other things. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's a reason for it. It was just one of those things where I was like, what is she been in there's, there's also an Eurovision in 2020. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot about that. <laughs> um, all right, there we go. So, there are the five nominees for supporting actress from the show Viola Davis, America Ferreira, Colleen, the eventual winner, Devine Joy Randolph, and Rachel McAdams going in. Uh, all right, guys, we'll go ahead and go on to Best Supporting Actor, if I could click the right picture off. Thanks. Uh, cool. Best Supporting Actor. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, and for this one, I'll go ahead and throw it once again to you, Jacob, as we start the rotation back around. Who were your nominees? All right. So my nominees were... Um... Uh, to no, I don't think it's a, the two of these are no surprise. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer, and then Ryan Gosling in Barbie. Um, and 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 to think Ryan Gosling as Ken would be an Oscar-nominated performance, um, I I would have I would have laughed. I would have said absolutely no way. Um, but he's absolutely my favorite part of the movie. I think I think he is just incredible. Um, then I also have Dominic Sessa from The Holdovers. I think it's pretty incredible what, what he's able to do in this movie, and it's his first. I think his first film role as well. Yes, like yes. I don't think he he's done nothing, um, and to put in that strong of a performance alongside somebody who should be an Oscar winner in Paul Giamatti. Um, I think, man, he, he's, he's got a bright future. Uh, and then I also went with Glenn Howerton from Blackberry, which I think is also a little underseen. Um, so I would highly recommend that as well. I think he's just, I think he's putting in a pretty strong performance as well. And then, uh, Jeremy Allen White from the Iron Claw. Um, I, I, I could have went with, uh, a couple of the brothers, but um, I, I decided to go with with him because um, I, I, I think his his story is just a little more emotional, and I just got more out of his character. Um, but much like supporting actress is the Divine Joy Randolph category, I think this is the Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> category. Yeah. Um, as much as I would love to see Ryan Gosling get the upset win. 
Um, I think this is RDJ's to lose. All right. Uh, Malcolm, to you, sir. Um, yeah, so um, for me, I've got Dominic Sessa from the Holdovers, Juan Gosling from Barbie. Um, and I couldn't decide between the two, so I thought so I put both um, Mark Ruffalo and William Defoe um, from Four Things in there because I think they're both great. And, um, and I also put Jimmy Allen Wright for the Iron Claw. I almost um, was going to change it up and put in the father instead, but um, I do think Jimmy Allen Wright is for, um, for me is probably the best of all, but um, the father for me is probably a close six. So, um, yeah. So I was going to say, if I can ask you, obviously the big thing with, with your list is the absence of the front runner Robert Downey Jr. What was the thought in selecting these five over him, just based on your opinion, obviously? Um, I mean, I like I, I like Robert Downey Jr. and Oppenheimer. To, as to me, like these five, I think do better than him personally. Um, and it's one of those ones like, um, because like, I can't remember it was, um. I pretty much um, used the same nominations I did when I um, did, when I was voting on um, the gone of the, gone of the winner. <laughs> was pretty, um, I just went back to, to that list, like just went back through. Like I changed a couple things around, but mm. um, so but I can't remember what my thought process seen for um, not putting Robert down in junior. Um, but yeah, but I mean I don't hate him. Like he oh, he would have, but he would have been around there as well. But yeah. Listen, I, I, I think, and I'll, I'll go to mine next, um, for Best Supporting Actor, I think it is incredible that, at least to me, this is the strongest category of the year in that I legitimately came up with about 20 performances that could have contended for this award. And even with that, it's still a runaway victory in my eyes for Robert Downey Jr., which is impressive. Like, it's genuinely impressive that the category is that stacked, and it almost doesn't feel competitive in terms of who's going to take the award. Um, but that said, my nominees personally, uh, of course, Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer. I also have Jamie Bell for All of Us Strangers, uh, again, a movie I really, really enjoyed, and I think the performances are truly the centerpiece of it. Uh, Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction, I cannot tell you how happy I was when I saw he got nominated for the Oscars because people were kind of doubting if he would. Uh, he is excellent in the film. Ryan Gosling for Barbie and Mark Ruffalo for Poor Things. Um, it's kind of incredible that these two performances happened in the same year because I kind of got the same feeling with both of them when talking about Oscar contentions. They kind of feel like Jack Sparrow-ish type performances in that there's such a level of comedic and physical commitments to the role that you can't help but respect it. Because normally the Academy wouldn't nominate something like this, but the fact that they did and it happened twice in the same year, I think is both commendable to both actors and incredible for the Academy. Because I genuinely, there was a part of me that thought before it happened that Gosling was not going to get nominated. All right, so uh, this is another one where there's not going to be much need for discussion because it has already been decided. Uh, there are five nominees that crossed over between our lists, and so the nominees for the show are Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer, Ryan Gosling for Barbie, Mark Ruffalo for Poor Things, Dominic Sessa for The Holdovers, and Jeremy Allen White for the Iron Claw. For what it's worth, Sessa was probably my last cut from the category in terms of pairing it down from 20 to 5. Uh, I'm totally cool with him being nominated. I uh, wish he had gotten a little more consideration at the actual awards. It seems like he was basically just getting put up for young actor awards at shows where those exist and nothing mm -hmm. else, which I think is a crime. I but yeah, what are you guys' thoughts? Any final thoughts on the category before we move on? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those ones like, um, there's ones again, I think supporting act deserves someone to, um, supporting actress because there was so many actors out there sort of vying to get in those five spots. Um, I think it was just a case of, um, people went with people, um, who they were familiar with, who, um, and may not have got around to the holdovers at the time of voting. Um, 
So that's probably why Sesame was down, especially in the critic side. Was, um, I think Holdovers didn't come out until December. I don't know how early critics got to see it. But I think um, some critics groups just didn't get around seeing it. And I think that's why Cesar got left out on some of them. So Yeah, I was going to say, here I think it came out around Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I don't know how far in advance it was being oh. screened it. For some reason, I feel the holdouts came out at Christmas time because it was it was a January <laughs> release for me. <laughs> no, that that would make sense though logically. Yeah, no, it was a it was Thanksgiving over here, um, which also makes sense for a Christmas film. Um, yeah. All right, so with that, if we're good, we'll go ahead and jump into actress. Uh, and for this one, Malcolm, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Who are your nominees? Um. Yeah, for my nominees for um, Best Actress, um, I've got Margot Robbie for Barbie, Emma Stone for Poor Things, Storm Reid for Missing, Sophie Wilde for Talk To Me, and Aquafina for Quiz Lady. Um, and um, I know Aquafina is kind of a, the red one here, but um, it's I, I think she was legitimately great in Quiz Lady. Because, um, and it's one of those movies I really loved a lot. Um, and which ended up in my top 12 at the time that I did do um, the ranking episode. But I think it I think it dropped out later once I'd seen some other things. But um and I mean Emma Emma Stone is probably um like my favourite other one. Like it's either gonna be her or Lady that's gonna win the Oscar for sure. And then um and I, I just wanted to give some love to like um Emma St- uh, um not Storm Reed for missing because I think she was she was great and for someone to sort of hold off that movie on her own and being such a young age I think it was a, it was a really big, good achievement for that as well so yeah all right uh so we'll go over to mine then so my nominees are Phoebe Dynever for Fair Play uh Anjane Ellis Taylor for Origin. Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon, Sandra Huller for Anatomy of a Fall, and Emma Stone for Poor Things. Um, personally, for me, I and I've said this before, obviously I don't think Lily Gladstone gave a bad performance. I nominated her. I don't... I wouldn't give it to her. Like To me, she's not the obvious winner. Uh, for me, it is Emma Stone. I think it's between her or Sandra Huller. Um, and I, I have other thoughts connected to Killers of the Flower Moon. I, I personally am not a fan of the way that Lily Gladstone's gone about campaigning for the award, so I'll totally be open about the fact that that may be affecting my, my point of view on her. I just don't like the idea of someone going out and basically being like, well, you know, there's not as many opportunities for Native American women, so vote for me this time because she already got hers. I mean, she's not saying anything that's not true. I just don't like the idea that she's campaigning that way instead of campaigning on the actual genuineness of the performance neither here or there uh i think it is emma stone again there's just a, a level of commitments and physicality uh commitments physically and emotionally that comes with playing that type of character that very few actresses are are able to give um i know she's already won an oscar for lala thing or lala land but this it, it tops that performance tenfold personally uh this is something you've never seen before uh yeah, and of course the others, again, uh, Phoebe Dynever, uh, Anjane Ellis-Taylor, both stars of movies that were sort of underlooked by the Oscars. Uh, if anyone remembers on TMG, Matt Beer, uh, who got to view some Sundance films last year, said that he would absolutely bet the house on the fact that Phoebe Dynever would get an Oscar nomination. Obviously that did not play out because the movie just kind of never went anywhere in terms of award steam. Uh, but I do agree with his assessment. She's excellent in the film. I would have put her in there. Um and against Sandra Huller, Anatomy of a Fall, like, it's that's just such a tough emotional film to be the lead of and to keep up for as long as that runtime is. Um, and not only to be compelling, to be convincing, uh, to navigate three different languages, because that's just impressive in and of itself. Uh, there's a lot to like here with these actresses. Some great, strong performances this year. Uh, so then, Jacob, when you're up, man, go ahead. 
Yeah, so I also have Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. I mean, when you're able to, you know, hold your own against Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro, you're you're doing something right. Um, I have a uh, Carrie Mulligan from Maestro. Um, I I just I think she was absolutely incredible. Again, I know I'm I'm higher on the movie than you two, but um, when I when I first saw the movie, I just I was blown away by her performance. I thought. Um, up to that point, it was it was my my favorite performance of the year, um, from from anyone. I I just I I absolutely loved it. Um, I have Greta Lee from Past Lives. Um, I don't. She's not doing anything like incredible, but she's just really really good, and I loved her character and her portrayal of the character. Um, and then um, Vivian O'Para for Rye Lane. Um, I think another another underseen uh, movie that you can catch on Hulu. Um, and and this was kind of so when when you presented me with with the topics, the reason I wanted to do this is because there were like in in some of the categories there were a few people that I just wanted to shout out and show love to, and, and she's one of them. I think she is just really good and a lot of fun in Rye Lane and then uh, Emma Stone in, in Poor Things. Like you said, she she did win for La La Land. And while she's great in La La Land, she is incredible in Poor Things. And I would argue that this is her best performance of her career so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um Rye Lane is a film I legitimately had never heard of it until it got BAFTA nominations. And then I was like, what is this? I mean, obviously, I know BAFTAs lean towards British films, but usually I feel like at least you hear about the movies. Right. This one for me was just kind of, I had never heard of this until it got nominated. Um, so it's awesome to hear that, that there are people who have seen it and appreciate it because sometimes those films get buried, man. Last, uh, I guess not last year anymore, 2022, I had the same effect with. Uh, Good luck to you, Leo Grand, the Emma Thompson film. Mm, um, yeah, that where that me. got <laughs> yeah, where, where that got I think got released to Hulu in America and it just kind of yeah. got buried and no one knew what it was. Um but it's a great film and I'm sure Rylane is as well. I'll have to check it out at some point. Uh yeah, I mean yeah. I, I and honestly like I think it was a cat same case for all of us strangers because of his British film. It, it, British films always get released like either late in America or just, um, yeah. 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 It, it's, a uh, yeah, I honestly, I feel like the only reason I knew about all about all of us strangers is because, uh, my sis, my little sister, uh, is a, a big Paul Mescal fan. So she'll be like, did you know he has a movie coming out? And I'm like, no, I didn't. What's that? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so with that said, we'll go ahead and move on then. Uh, so off of our nominees, we only had two make it into the actual category. Uh, Lily Gladstone will make it, as will Emma Stone, who was put up by all three of us. So in this instance, we all get to nominate one to join the category. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'll go back to you first. Uh, who, or who went first on this one? Was it? Malcolm, I'll go back to you first, Malcolm. Who do you want to put forth as your nominee for Best Actress? Um, Margot Robbie from Barbie. No, I was going to say, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, no hesitation. All right, Margot Robbie from Barbie it is. Uh, Jacob, I'll go to you next. Mm. I'm going to go with Vivian O'Para. Yeah. All right. So that is Margot Robbie and Vivian Opera, uh, which then brings it to me. Right <laughs> I hope so. That that's how I assumed. Maybe Opara, because like that's the only yeah the only One thing I can two. think of. Uh, which I, brings I, it to I me. think I've heard it pronounced as Opara, but I could be wrong. Well, it's one of the two. Uh, hopefully, yeah. off the back of a strong performance, we'll hear her name more going forward. Because uh, it's always great to see new talent rise out. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Uh, so we have Margot Robbie. We have Vivian Opara. Opera. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna put Sandra Huller up there. Uh, again, as much as I like all three performances from these women, I again, if I am saying that I think she's the one that's contending against Emma Stone, that I should, I should put my weight behind her. Uh, I think it's an impressive performance in a very difficult film. Um, and certainly because people were saying that she could be nominated for one of two films. She's also in the zone of interest and I've seen both. Thank God she was nominated for this and not the zone of interest. Uh, well, she would have been supporting for the zone of interest anyway. Is that, she's oh, I know. But, into, yeah. No, but still, I get you. Yeah. I, I'd much rather see this film get awarded than zone of interest. Uh, so with that said, we'll go ahead and move into best actor uh and we'll go ahead uh i'll go ahead and go first on this one i'm trying to remember what the rotation was uh so i'll go ahead and go first on this and my choice for actor is uh where is it wrong click so i went with paul giamatti from the holdovers uh killian murphy from oppenheimer uh, Andrew Scott from All of Us Strangers, Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction, and then for an outside choice, I went with Koji Yakusho, and I might have butchered that, uh, from Perfect Days, which is Japan's submission for Best International Feature. Uh, it is nominated at the awards. It's more than likely not to win because I have a hard time believing a film nominated for Best Picture and that award doesn't win. Uh, but that said, because it was nominated, it got a release here uh, when it probably wouldn't have before, and I got to see it. And this movie, for anyone who doesn't know what it is, essentially uh, the movie was originally greenlit as a promotional film for Jap Japan's renovation of its public toilet system. Uh, they've basically they renovated their public toilets to be all these unique designs to sort of encourage discussion in public, I guess, after the pandemic. Um, a German filmmaker, uh, Wim Wenders, went over, saw what they did, said, hey, I'll make this movie, and turned it into an artistic piece. Um, and this guy plays a toilet cleaner who's just a quiet guy content with his day. Uh, you don't really get to know a lot about him. You learn a little bit about his past. You learn that he's had some difficulties. But the movie doesn't really dive into it because that's not what it's about. But I think the actor portrays a really layered character so well he and, and he's given so little to work with but he makes the most of it and for that it's a really impressive character compared to something like killian murphy and oppenheimer or giamatti and the holdovers where on the page right in front of you there's a lot of complexity to the characters he has nothing and i think he turns in just as strong a performance as they do that said, the complexity definitely helps. I mean, Giamatti and Murphy are the front runners. I would love to see Giamatti win an Oscar. Personally, I think it's going to go to Killian Murphy, which I also would agree with. Um, and then the other two, Andrew Scott and Jeffrey Wright, just, again, excellent, strong, solid leading performances. You know, nothing maybe necessarily too strong or unique to say, but definitely some of the best of the year. Uh, so, Jacob, over to you. Yeah, so my nominations are uh, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, which is also my like prediction. But my personal pick would be Paul Giamatti. Um, I have Bradley Cooper in Maestro. Uh, Jay Baruchel for Blackberry. Um, I thought he puts uh, puts in a really strong performance here, and um, I'm used to seeing him as like this this comedic actor, you know, kind of. You know, in, in the side roles or as the voice of Hiccup in the How to Train Your Dragon series. Um, and so this was just, it was something different from him. And, you know, I thought he was putting in a, a really, really strong performance. Um, and then I have Zac Efron for the Iron Claw, which, um, you know, not just for, for the dialogue, but for also like the physical stuff that he had to do in this movie. Um, there's a little, uh, behind the scenes with uh, Chavo Guerrero, who did the uh, choreography, the wrestling choreography for the movie, and he practiced uh, the the cross body like twenty times. Um, Zac Efron did. And they actually had like a real wrestling match. He says so, um, and I think it translates well in the movie uh, as well. So um, yeah, I think the fact that the Iron Claw didn't get anything 
at, at the Academy Awards is just baffling to me. And that's not my wrestling bias coming out. Like, even if I wasn't a wrestling fan, <laughs> I still would have thought this was a really great movie with strong performances um, and just, just real emotion. Like, that first hour is so much fun. And then, you know, the, the last half is just super emotional. And um, I think Zac Efron just leads this movie so well. I would say blame A24 for putting all their eggs in the basket of past lives. <laughs> it seems like that's where they invested all their marketing money. Uh, and unfortunately, that didn't work out either for them. So <laughs> uh, that said, Malcolm, on to you. Um, so, I mean, I think with the, the encore, I think it was a case of they released it too late because of this. It was, it was more the strikes that... Um, that caused them to do a late release, which if they release it like maybe in November, um, then I think it might have had enough momentum to sort of um, to get some nominations. But anyway, what I've got for best lead actor is um, I've got Zac Efron for The Iron Claw. I've got Paul Giamatti for The Holdovers. I've got Timothy Chalamet for Wonka. I've got Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer. And I've got Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction, which was a pretty late um change i made because initially i had Tobin bell from saw 10 there but um after having finally seen american fiction i think gp was great and um yeah but it is now an Avalon prime all that but yeah um i don't really have um and um I, and i i think and i quite liked um to as well because like he's pretty much the way i expected a young one to be before he gets all jaded um because people kept on stealing his stuff and all that, but um, and um, I and I think he was fun and whimsical. I'm all for the whimsy. I I'm again for anyone who watched yesterday's show. We talked about this before we started recording. Austin Howell, who I think literally verbatim said, "I fucking hate that whimsy bullshit," <laughs> uh, was not a fan of. <laughs> Uh, again, I, this to me is the beauty of cinema. I appreciate that two people can to feel two totally different ways about something for the exact same reason. Uh, that is uh, cinema if I've ever seen it. Uh, yeah, so anything else to add about the performances? Uh, nothing much has already been said. All right, so then we'll go to the nominees for the show. Four people made it through. We have Zach Efron for the Iron Claw, Paul Giamatti for the Holdovers, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. Uh, and so with that said, uh, we'll go to the final spot. So right now, Malcolm, you and I only have one option left. Jacob, you have two left. So you could put this in and still get a choice in for director or best picture. Malcolm, if you or I go, this will be our last vote in for the episode. So is there anyone well, either of you particularly wants to put forth? Yeah, but before I, since I do have one one more, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you two if there's anyone you're super strong about. Otherwise, I, I can put somebody through and we can each have a a, a choice going going forward. Because I'm, I'm saving my I'm saving my last one for a specific category. <laughs> um, let me look at let me look at the list. I, I have the the knowledge of having it in front of me. Let me look real quick. I I think I can live with who's nominated. Uh, so I I'll put someone forth here. Uh. I'm going to put forth uh, Andrew Scott. Again, I, I think All of Us Strangers falls with uh, The Iron Claw as a film that genuinely, I think, if it had come out in time, would have had more contention for the Oscars. It had a lot of contention at other award shows, uh, but it, it just released too late in the States for a lot of people to see it. And his performance is the center of it. Um, and especially, uh, I was going to name someone in particular, but I forget offhand who's nominated, but th there's, uh, I'm just so shocked that he's not nominated. Like it, it is truly a crime, especially for someone who 
doesn't have the biggest of careers like this should be a career making performance and just simply because it's not been seen it's not going to be uh so you know what the best i can do for him is uh, nominate him here sorry buddy but i mean um i think go um go because i think andrew scott even um missed out on a BAFTA nomination and a bunch of his co-stars got nominated uh, for oh, all of dude, us names. don't even i don't understand yeah. how that <laughs> happened I, I just think he is literally the heart, soul, story. He is everything to this movie, uh, more than a lot of films. Uh, I, so I don't understand it. But uh, he's who I put forth. I have no problem using my last slot. No matter what I contend for with the other two, I have no problem using my last slot and accepting uh, it is what it is. Uh, Wonk is getting a Best Picture nomination, and I'm okay with that. So, uh, well, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Honestly, I don't care. So with that said, those are our acting noms. Let's go ahead, guys, and get on to best director. Uh, Jacob, we'll go ahead and put you up first, man. Who did you nominate? Yeah, my nominees are Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, uh, Alexander Payne for The Holdovers, Ben Affleck for Air, Celine Song for Past Lives, and Bradley Cooper for Maestro. I don't think anything needs to be said about Oppenheimer. Um, I, I, I really like what Ben Affleck was, was able to do with air, um, and, and leading this, you really, it's, it's, it's a stat cast and he was able to get strong performances, um, from all of them and as well as, you know, start, um, having a role in the movie himself. Um, again, I just love past lives. So I wanted to show it some love too. And then. Yes. Um, Bradley Cooper for for my show again. I'm I'm higher on the movie, but I think it's it's really good. And I think it's got some solid direction, um, and I think he was able to take the story from you know the the younger years and in, in, into the older years. And I thought he was able to to get some really strong performances from from like Carey Mulligan um, and and some of the the younger um, actors and actresses. I, I thought he put together a a pretty strong film, um, and then. The holdovers is just fantastic. It was my number two uh, movie of last year, and I just I absolutely love it. Um, but again, um, there's a lot of categories that are uh, pretty much locks, I think. Um, and so um, I like to also call this one the Christopher Nolan Award. Yeah, I, I think most people should feel safe betting their house on this one. Um, don't take that as actual legal advice. Malcolm, <laughs> I'll go to you. You never know, man. They could flip an envelope and all hell breaks loose. Uh, Malcolm, I'll go to you next, man. What is your vote? Uh, for best um, director, I've got Alexander Payne for The Holdovers, Greta Gerwig for Barbie, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, Yorga Tim for Four Things, and Paul King for Wonka. Um, and it's one, once again, it's it just comes down to the vet. I just really love Wonka. I think um, the way Paul King decided to do it um, and all that, um, I think it was great. Um, and it's one of those ones like, um, for me personally, I thought the writing of Buffy was better than the directing. Um, but I do still think her direct, Greta Gerwig's directing was great as well. So, um, so I didn't mind her getting the nomination as well. Um, and it, and as we've talked enough about the other ones, um, <laughs> as it is, uh, so yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, so my, my nominees are, are basically almost in line with uh, the academy. I, I literally would flip one for the obvious person we'd flip in. Uh, this is when I actually do think the academy got mostly right. Uh, so for me, Greta Gerwig for Barbie would go in for Jonathan Glazer for The Zone of Interest. Uh, if anyone watched the episode yesterday, I made it very clear that while I respect the film, I'm not a fan of it and I would not have put him up for best director. But aside from that, I think they got it correct. Uh, Yorgos Lanthimos for Poor Things, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. I would put Scorsese up for best director because I think the scale of what that film is, the fact that he's working with a mostly uh, partially inexperienced, but also small, you know, big cast, and he's getting performances from everyone 
uh, direction wise, literally the only misstep in the entire film is Brendan Fraser's performance, which I would blame on Scorsese. But the fact that everything else about that film is masterfully crafted, I'll forgive one bad idea. Uh, and then Justine Triet for Anatomy of a Fall, again, to make a three hour courtroom drama engaging, uh, and this one literally being a courtroom drama. Uh, is impressive feat in and of itself. Uh, the performances she draws out of the cast are incredible. And again, I think there is something to be said about balancing a film that is in three languages. Like, to not let an audience get lost in that is impressive to me. So I would nominate her as well. Um, so that does bring us then to our options. Uh, four people make it in. We have Greta Gerwig, Yorgos Lanthimos, Christopher Nolan, and Alexander Payne, which means when we go to our choices, of course, Jacob, you do still have two, although Malcolm, if you did want to vouch for a director over a best picture, you could choose to. Who does someone want to put forth? You take this, Jacob. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I'm, 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 I'm kind of torn because now I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself for not putting Sean Durkin in for the Iron Claw. Um, that was a, that was a tough cut. And as, as I was thinking about it, I was like, ah, oh, that should have been my fifth. Um, but, um, I will go, I'll go, I'll go with, uh, Ben Affleck for air. Okay. He, he was on my side list. He 100% was someone that was in contention. Um, I think the energy that he brings to this movie is incredible. Certainly after the disaster that was lit by night, this is a return to form. Uh, and I'm looking forward to his next film that he has with Netflix now. Mm. It's like a, some, like a political thriller, I guess, action, like an action uh -huh. thriller. Yeah. Him and Matt Damon reteaming again. It seems like they're going to continue to work together, which I'm cool with. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Malcolm hey. Good throwing. Oh yeah, no, that sounds good. It sounds like, um, there's I know a lot of people do say like we agree as a snap, but it's one of those ones like I don't I le legitimately don't think it is because it's one of those ones like she was definitely would have been out there in that conversation because um I've made this argument with on online for to a few people but like basically, basically like Nolan was the only sort of lock and it was basically like seven other directors fighting for that la those last four spots. Like, really good, I do believe it was one of them. Um, and it was just a case of which way the Oscars were falling that time around. So. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't think her not being nominated is a snub. Um, if, if anything, my distaste is just more for Jonathan Glazer's nomination. Uh, but that said, uh, I... I I do think the direction of that film is stronger than the screenplay. Um, so I would have preferred to see her get nominated there over screenplay, but it is what it is. It, you know, it, it's all small bananas. It's not worth fighting over. So that is going to be that for Best Director. We'll go ahead as we come up on the two-hour mark. We're moving into the final category, which is Best Picture. Malcolm, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, sir. You are up first. Go ahead and give me your best picture nominees. Um, for me, the my, the best picture nominees, and this is one of those ones that, um, like one of those categories. I think I just took my top eleven movies of the year, so because it's the way that I, I, I think people, most people, would do it in the Oscars. You know, I, I don't know. Um, but for me, the but twelve nom uh, the eleven nominees are doing is that the holdovers wonka um barbie dungeons and dragons honor among thieves a movie that doesn't come out in america till next week um up for <laughs> um oppenheimer poor things the iron claw missing talking again the galaxy volume three um and as well those ones like i i think that these are just some great movies um and um well yeah like this year it is looking like it has got going to be up and on that wins best picture next year but it's like um and the reason i didn't i i felt comfortable doing um going this rather than thinking about what would actually be nominated for the oscars because a lot of these are movies that 
Oscars typically don't normally go for anyway. Um, <laughs> like they don't normally go for fantasy. Like Thousand of Dragons and Manga probably wouldn't have been up there. Um, New Zealand movies very really do get it loved just because of the way they get released. <laughs> um, but it's up was one of those ones. I think um, if it was released in the states um, in, in that time frame, I think. I do think there might have been a chance it may have squeaked in, but even then, I don't know if that is true or not, but yeah. Uh, of all the technicalities that have been pushed tonight by Malcolm, this is the most technicality pushing film, but you know what? We're here for fun, so fuck it. Uh, I'm the only one taking this seriously. Jacob, I'll go over to you, man. What are your picks? So my nominees would be Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Oppenheimer, The Holdovers, uh, The Iron Claw, Air, John Wick Chapter 4, Blackberry, Past Lives, Barbie, Maestro, and Poor Things. Um, not my top 11 um, of the year, but um, 11 that I, I really enjoy. Um, I think John Wick Chapter 4 um, is just one of the best action movies of the last decade, maybe even of the of the cent of, of this century. I think it's it's really good. Um, High praise. I, yeah, no, I have like it's, it's action from from like start to finish, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and um, I didn't think it needed to be a nearly three hour movie when I when it first was announced, um, but now I don't mind that it's almost uh, three hours because. <laughs> Uh, it, it's great. Uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I, there was still a sliver of hope when the nominations were announced that maybe it could sneak into that final spot. Um, but unfortunately, I think it just lost steam as, as the year went on um, because it was getting high praise when it first came out. Um, yeah. But just ultimately, I think it, it, just, it just lost steam and other movies were, were getting talked about more. Um, but again, I think... This is Oppenheimer's to lose. I would love for the holdovers to pull that upset because I absolutely love that movie. Um, of the nominees, it is my favorite. Um, so, you yeah, know, I just, I, I really love all these movies. Again, Poor Things was a, a late addition, but like, man, that's such a good movie. It is. Weird, it's weird but great. Yeah, so that I'll go ahead and jump into mine. Uh, so again, my list has been from the perspective of, you know, all of these films are movies that are in my top 20, but they're films, they're not necessarily my exact top 20, but they are the films that I think the Academy would legitimately nominate with the right campaign and the right whatever else that goes with it. Um, probably the biggest surprise to most people, it, biggest surprise, maybe not from my own opinion, but in terms of what has been discussed, is uh, the fact that I didn't nominate Barbie. I just I have to be honest, I genuinely don't think it's one of the best films of the year. I think it's very, very good. I think there are elements of it that are worthy of not being nominated. I just got to overall, I don't think it's one of the best. That said, my choices were Air, All of Us Strangers, American Fiction, Anatomy of the Fall, Blackberry, The Holdovers, Oppenheimer, Origin, Past Lives, Poor Things, and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which I, I do still genuinely believe that if as long as the third one delivers, it has an actual genuine chance. I wanted this one to get nominated, but I kind of just always felt it wasn't going to happen because eh, the Oscars are the Oscars. But uh, those are my choices. In terms of what made it, and I'm only just realizing I never actually made that graphic, would be the final one of the show. Uh, so in terms of what made it, if you guys want to vamp for a second while I type it out real quick, how's everybody doing? Doing great. Um, yeah, no, I'm, this this was fun. Yeah, like you said, when you presented the, the, the topics, this was the first one that jumped out because there were just things that I wanted to, to highlight that didn't get love from the Academy, such as the Iron Claw, um, which I, I, I hope you are able to see um, soon because I do think it's it's an incredible movie. That first hour is, is great, but that last hour is 
Oh man, it's rough, but it's so good. Yeah, I, I looked it up earlier. The encore is actually on digital now, um, at, but it, it comes out on physical media in, on March the 26th. Just a couple of weeks. That's great. Yeah, I will. I will be picking that up. Um. <laughs> All right, so I got. I got it written down here. So the nine films that made it through on votes are Air, Barbie, Blackberry, The Holdovers, The Iron Claw, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, and Spider Man into the or across the Spider Verse. Excuse me. Which means, gentlemen, you each get one film of your choice to add to the best picture slate for the show. What are we adding? Come on, you know I'm going to add up for it in there. <laughs> I almost want to say no because it doesn't qualify, but we're at the end, so there's no point saying no. <laughs> can I? Can I say no because it doesn't qualify? <laughs> Your show. Do you want do you want Walker in um, Best Picture? I'm fine with it. I like Walker. Do <laughs> you want Walker in Best Picture? Well, I mean, it's up to you if you want to say no because of that. I, I I'm fine either way. Yeah, I'll, I'll do Walker. I'll do Walker. <laughs> we'll just send Austin into a conniption. Uh, seriously, I mean, I mean, Wonka. at this point, Wonka, Wonka knows my opinions. Um, uh. No, no, no. Wonka, Wonka is the most uh, impressive film of 2023 on sheer personal opinions alone. It is both a best picture nominee for this show and a bottom five film of the year. <laughs> um, I, I will say, um, if you want to hear some interesting opinions on John Wick Chapter 4, Stephen Shepard did some interesting opinions on tournament fights. Um, I think at the time this drops will be last night. Now, but... Last night? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I now I'm intrigued. Uh, Jacob will let's go to say he, uh, Let's just say Stephen didn't like John Wick Chapter Four. We all voted for him for it. Yeah, can I, can I? What can I see the nominees one more time so I don't pick something that I already forgot? No, you're good. So we have Air, Barbie, Blackberry, The Holdovers, The Iron Claw, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse, and Walk Up. So looking right. at your list, it looks like it's just John Wick or Maestro. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one of those is an Oscar rating movie, and the other one uh, is, is not. Um, I know which one I'm voting for. <laughs> so I'm actually going to throw you a bone just because I'm super interested in this movie, and I'm sure I'm going to love it when I finally do watch it. But let's put Anatomy of a Fall in there. Hey, I won't say no to that. Do you want to go back and retroactively make Sean Durkin your director then? We'll just rewrite history. <laughs> I mean, if you're okay with that. Fuck it, why not? We could put up Roar on Best Picture too at the end of the show. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Sean Durkin, good enough for best director. Anatomy of a Fall, Waka. See Uproar when it comes out. Malcolm, I'm sure you know. When is it released in the US? Uh, next week, March the 15th. There you go. If it's in your market, go check it out. Uh, it's a film that Malcolm has personally been hyping up from down there for a while. Uh, so go check it out. Uh, but there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the Best Picture nominees for this evening. I am not going to bother going back through and reading out all the ones from the show because I did not write them all down. Uh, but with that said, it has been a fun evening with you guys, gentlemen. Before we do close out, uh, I have a master list of all the films I considered for various awards, uh, subtracting the ones, of course, that you guys already named, uh, just so as I'm not doubling back on myself. Uh, I'm going to run those down before we head out just to throw some more great films and performances out at people. But before we do that, where can the good people find you, Jacob? Uh, yeah, mostly over at the Movie Hero Network. Um, depending on when this drops, uh, Austin Howell and I will have either already done a podcast about movies or are doing a podcast about movies either way 
go check it out. We're doing a blind ranking episode. We each made a wheel. Um, he made a wheel of comedy movies from the 90s and 2000s. For me, I made a wheel of 80s and 90s action movies. For him, we're going to spin them, blind rank them 1 through 20, um, and see see what our lists uh, come out as. So that should be a lot of fun. All right. And then, Malcolm, sir, where can the good people find you? And specifically, as we come up on the Oscars, uh, what's going on with Gone with the Wind? Um, well, I mean, Gone with the Wind, you can find me on Tape Redown for the host. Um, Gone with the Wind, that happens um, every Monday night. We'll definitely be there um, next week talking about the winners of the Oscars. Um, and then the week after that, we'll be doing the Gone with the Wind Awards. Um, but you can also find me on hosting Rankham, um, oh, which is happening tomorrow, because I'm not going to try and compete for the Oscars. Um, and we'll be doing the top show of um, Best Actress winning performances um, from the Oscars. Or actually, te technically, because this is uploading later today, when we're, we're recording it the night before. Uh, so yeah, yeah. later tonight, go check that out. He's doing it tonight. Go check that out. Yeah, um, I mean to say that, but... <laughs> no, no, you're good, you're good. I'm, I'm pretty sure it, Jacob already covered it that we normally do shows on the day of the drop anyway. <laughs> you're but, good, you're good, man. Um, and you can find me doing... Um, Slow, very slowly getting through this um, tournament on full metal, but I promise you it is just about finished. I'll just have to upload a bunch of matches, but um, which I do aim to do this week. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for me. All right, guys. Uh, you can, of course, find me here on TMG Entertainment. Uh, we have one more episode this weekend uh, with this next set of episodes of battleground countdown tomorrow i am joined by matt beer and amaru moses at an earlier time ahead of the academy awards we're going to be talking about the next best films of 2023 of course most people have covered their top 10 lists already so we're going to be skipping 1 through 11 we're going to be covering 12 through 22 in deep discussion and then building a master 22 film list at the end of the show so be sure to tune in and check that out we did worst films yesterday and again following tomorrow's show the official schedule will be posted of all the episodes coming soon uh i know i've talked to both of you guys so there are plans in the future to have you back on which i do look forward to uh but with that said we'll go ahead and sign off for the evening thank you guys for watching uh all that's left is i'm going to rattle off a bunch of these here uh so in terms of what was considered uh, for best adapted screenplay of course i have to shout out all of us strangers are you there god it's me margaret Blackberry, I think, was a really well-written film. Dumb Money and Theater Camp. For what it is, it's really well-written. Uh, best Original Screenplay, Elemental, for me, A Return to Form from Pixar. Somewhere in Queens, Ray Romano's directorial debut, actually really well-written. And They Clone Tyrone, an intriguing sci-fi film. Uh, the category of supporting actress, the only person I had on the side list that was not named was Danielle Brooks of The Color Purple. Excellent performance, underrated film. Uh, best supporting actor. I asked all the people that got named. I still have 12 actors on my side list. Ben Affleck, an heir. Genuinely great. Robert De Niro, Killers of the Flower Moon, an actual Oscar nominee. Coleman Domingo in The Color Purple. Excellent. Noah Galvin in Theater Camp. Talk about commitment. The man danced in a dress. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Flora and Son. Great supporting performance from him. Milo Machado Granier. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he is the young child in Anatomy of a Fall. Excellent performance. John Magaro, probably the forgotten element of past lives playing her husband in the modern day. Uh, Jonathan Majors, Creed 3. I know he's not acting right now, but he gave a great performance, so I'm going to call it for what it is. Uh, Paul Meskel for All of Us Strangers, the only performance in the film I didn't nominate. I think he's fourth of four, but he's still excellent. Chris Messina in Air, Unforgettable. Benny Safdie and Oppenheimer, he's probably second on the supporting list for me. I thought he was excellent as the German scientist. And Bill Skarsgård in John Wick Chapter 4, genuinely terrifying. Probably the best villain in all of those films. Uh, best Actress, Fantasia Barina, once again, Color Purple, incredibly underrated. Abby Ryder Fortson, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. If she wasn't a child, it'd be higher considered. Eve Hewson, Flora and Son, and Tiana Taylor, 1001. Great performance in a small film. Uh, best actor, Paul Dano, dumb, dumb money. Alden Ehrenreich for fair play. Uh, legitimately, 
Ryonosuke Kamiki for Godzilla Minus One. Excellent performance in an excellent film. Uh, Barry Keown for Saltburn and T.O.U. for Past Lives. Uh, Best Director, Blitz Bazawule for The Color Purple. Ava DuVernay, Origin, Andrew Haig, All of Us Strangers, Chad Stahelski for John Wick Chapter 4, and Vim Vendors for Perfect Days. And then finally, Best Picture, Godzilla Minus One, legitimately considered it, pulled it out at the last minute for Blackberry because I forgot about that movie and did not put it on the list. And then Killers of the Flower Moon, an excellent film, just little bits that knocked it out for me. Thank you guys for watching. Tune in again tomorrow. Till next time. See ya.